This is The Garden of English. I'm Tim Freitas, and today we're going to talk about sound devices, and we're going to talk about how we can analyze how sound devices function in verse, in literature, and nonfiction. So, let's do it together. All right, today we are going to talk about analyzing sound devices. And if you don't know what sound devices are, they're just ways that authors play with language to amplify and accentuate certain sounds that you're supposed to focus on as some as a sensual experience, maybe sometimes for both the eyes and the hearing, uh, but mostly it is indeed for the sensory experience of hearing. Um, and it helps to create a full kind of 3D, um, you know, a, a third dimension to reading um, that becomes really immersive. Um, so this is really like the four, 3D, 4K version of what reading looks like, okay? Uh, before we get into things, though, I always want to give a huge shout-out to our Patreon supporters, which you can actually see up here. For the, um, uh, We are grateful uh, that you're willing to support the Garden of English as we work to produce as much content as we can to help people um, and teachers and students analyze literature. Um, if you're interested in finding out the benefits of what actually a Patreon subscription entails, you can check out this video here. Um, so please consider checking that out uh, and supporting the Garden of English, right? And if you don't want to do Patreon, there are plenty of other ways that you can support, like getting cool t-shirts like this one, which you can also get um, at the link that is linked up here as well. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, let's actually get into things. Let's talk about sound devices. Uh, please note, that there are four main sound devices when you actually are reading. Uh, the one that people are most familiar with is alliteration, and that's the repetition of similar sounds at the beginning of words. Uh, you have assonance, which is the repetition of vowel sounds in the middle or at the end of words, and then you have consonance, which is the repetition of consonant sounds in the middle or at the end of words. And then last but not least, we tie up the end here with the word onomatopoeia. Please note, it's not onomatopoeia. The T doesn't all of a sudden make an N sound just because it's what you've been saying your whole life. It is onomatopoeia, which interestingly enough is one of the only words in the English language that has four vowels back to back there at the end. Um, but onomatopoeia is when the word itself is meant to make the sound um, that it's actually spelled like um, for that experience. So the word like buzz, uh, I remember when my oldest son was about three, he had buzz in his playroom in the middle of the room and he was lecturing him and he was saying, buzz, don't you know that your name is onomatopoeia? Um, and uh, I was proud English dad moment there. Uh, anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at uh, how sound devices function in multiple different um, capacities in different pieces of, or should I say, in different readings. And we're going to actually start with uh, a reading from, um, from All Summer in a Day. So let's change my screen here a little bit. There we go. And this is the same reading that I did as I looked at Analyzing Metaphor with Carly Stevens. Um, and if you're interested in checking out that video, it's up here. Uh, today, we're just not going to focus on the video, I mean, on the metaphors, even though they're still highlighted here. Uh, we're going to focus on the sound devices that are here. So this comes from All Summer in a Day. It's a small excerpt, okay? Uh, I am going to read the context here and the passage for those of you that have never actually read this before or haven't watched that other video that I mentioned before. So it says, this excerpt is a is from a story about a class of school children on Venus, which in this tale is a jungle world of constant torrential rainstorms, where the sun is only visible for two hours every seven years. In this selection, the children have just emerged from their cramped gray underground shelters that echo the deafening rain. The sun has just arrived. Um, by the way, this is also the reading excerpt that is uh, that I use in my uh, syntax analysis video, which you can also find up here. So anyway, um, we're going to read this reading selection, and we're going to focus on those sound devices. And as we do, I want you to think, can I pick them out as um, that Freitas jerk reads them aloud? And don't forget, we're thinking about alliteration, uh, we're thinking about assonance, we're thinking about consonants, and we're thinking about onomatopoeia. So here we go. The children lay out laughing on the jungle mattress and heard it sigh and squeak under them, resilient and alive. They ran among the trees, they slipped and fell, they pushed each other, they played hide-and-seek tag, but most of all, they squinted at the sun, 
until the tears ran down their faces. They put their hands up to that yellowness and that amazing blueness, and they breathed of the fresh, fresh air and listened and listened to the silence which suspended them in the blessed sea of no sound and no motion. They looked at everything and savored everything. Then wildly, like animals escaped from their caves, they ran and ran in shouting circles. They ran for an hour and did not stop running. What a beautiful reading selection. Um, Ray Bradbury is just absolutely one of my most favorite authors. But let's talk about the sound devices here because this is a beautiful mix of both alliteration uh, and consonants here. Uh, and we want to check out what they do. So hopefully while I was reading, you noticed the first bit of alliteration here. Um, and we're going to highlight this as we go through actually is the uh, lay and the laughing, right? Because we've got the repeated la sound here. Now, this is actually important because when you provide commentary for sound devices, you want to actually say, how does amplifying this particular sound create an experience that is worth, um, that is actually worth having people do um, or experience while reading? And so because of that, what, what happens is, I have to silence my phone, that's embarrassing. Again, a couple videos in a row. Anyway, um, what happens here is we want to say what's going on in the story and how does that sound bring us there. And if you think about this, look at what we first highlighted. We've got this idea of la, la, right? Think about the joviality that's typically tied with that when you see a little kid skipping down the road and is like la, 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 right? Um, so notice that right off the bat, we have these positive sounds that are coming out and being amplified, which is very playful and innocent. And that's exactly what these kids are doing as they go outside. Um, and then you're going to notice that the next bit of sound devices that come up are going to be more alliteration with the repeated s sound. And we're going to see this again, but notice that we've got the sigh and squeak under them, resilient and alive. So we've got this S sound here. And notice that the S sound is very different than, let's say, the C sound or the K sound or the P sound. Why? Because with the S sound, you've got S, but with a P or a K, you've got the hard K, -k or P, -p right? But notice that these children are playful with the laws, and they're also feeling comfortable. They're not feeling threatened. And because of that, we've got that soft, repeated S sound. Also, the idea of a sigh and a squeak, right? Those sounds are, the S is tied to those sounds. When you hear things that squeak, when you hear things that sigh. And so now we've got that repeated S sound immersing us in the sounds that the kids are actually going through. So we've got this kind of joyful, playful laughter, and we've got also this comforting sighing and squeaking, and we're really getting to be fully immersed in this picture here, okay? But let's keep looking because there's more um, uh, uh, alliteration and consonants here that's going to help us. So um, we want to look to the part where it talks about how that they squinted at the sun, okay? So we see more of that S coming out, and notice it's not a hard uh, S sound, but it still stands out, okay? Okay. Um, but we, if we continue, right, when they squint at the sun, they put their hands up and they were gazing at the blue sky and the yellowness of the sun. And notice what happens here. They breathe with the fresh, fresh air that suspended them. Oh, sorry, and listened. So we've got the listen here and we've got the listen again. So we've got the sh and the s, and notice those are similar, right? But this would be considered more on the consonant side of things because this is in the middle or at the end of the words, right? And now we have to the silence. So we've got the s. I'm going to actually just highlight the whole word here because it's got the double s sound. Even the c makes the s sound. And we've got suspended. So we've got some more of the s sound in the blessed c. So we've got that more s there of no sound, more s and no motion. And notice that although it's the T-I-O-N, it's still the sh sound. Now this is really important here as we think about the experience because at this moment the kids are stopping and they're listening and they're, all of their attention is paid to the silence that's around them. Why is this so important? Because look at what it says here, right? Their underground shelters consistently echo the deafening rain that's always happening. And now they're listening to the silence. And look at the look at the sounds that are amplified for us in this moment. When they stop, what are the sounds that are amplified? The shh and the s. I want you to think about this. First of all, those, once again, are soft sounds, right? But I also want you to imagine 
when you turn everything off and you're sitting by yourself, let's say that you accidentally left your radio on, but it's on at a very low volume. There's no um, channel playing, or you get to the end of a track that you're listening to on whatever uh, recording you're listening to. There's that constant kind of right? What would the sound of silence actually be? The sound of silence would not be k -k -k or p -p -p. no, it would be something soft. And that's what we have here for our S and our SH. And this is really helping bring out that silence that the student, I mean, that the children are experiencing while they get out there and they don't hear anything, but they can hear the silence. They can listen to it. And notice that we get to hear that kind of soft ambient noise in the background that they hear that is in stark contrast to the deafening rain. So notice that the uh, alliteration and the, uh, and the consonants here really helps add to the experience that we have as we read this piece. So you know, in the last videos that we looked at here, we had how do the metaphors add? And then in the other video that I released that dealt with syntax, we talked about how the syntax slows us down so that we have a similar experience to the kids. And the syntax speeds us up and fills us with action verbs so we have a similar experience to the kids. And now we've got the sound devices also adding to it. So that's why this is such a rich passage when we talk about a um, fully immersive reading experience because all of the choices that Bradbury makes bring this out for the reader. And if we can read like this, we get to actually appreciate reading so much more. So that's what it looks like in this particular work of fiction here and in this particular reading selection. And like I said, I do recommend that you click up on the little eye up there to watch the other videos about metaphor and sentence structure uh, in dealing with this. Okay. Um, so now let's actually look at this on the lang uh, or in the nonfiction side of things. Okay. Uh, and then we'll finish up with some poetry. What we have on the screen here right now actually is taken from AP Central. So this is fully accessible right online. Uh, and this is an excerpt from uh, The Plastic Pink Flamingo, A Natural History, written by Jennifer Price. This is, happens to be my most favorite prompt that they've ever released on an AP exam, by the way. That's why I actually have my pink flamingo right back here. Um, and in my classroom, I have a pink, fl a pink yard flamingo named Jake Rhoda. Um, named after Jake Rhoda, who actually named him for me. Uh, but anyway, let's actually look in here. I want to point out a couple uh, areas. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I want to point out a couple areas of alliteration. Um, and I'm going to basically just tell you what this whole passage is about. This whole passage is meant to characterize America as being incredibly shallow and trendy. Okay? Um, that's what this piece is about. And there is alliteration in here. Now, when you analyze rhetoric... Analyzing literary and rhetorical d devices only uh, is not typically the wisest thing to do. If you want to know why, you can check out my rhetorical analysis playlist up here. Um, but when you can pinpoint a literary device or a rhetorical device, you do want to, and you could talk about it for analysis, you by all means bring it up. So I want to just look at... Um, I want to just look at where the alliteration shows up in this piece. And the first thing that we're going to see is it shows up right here in flocking to Florida, okay? And returning home with flamingo souvenirs. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And the other time that you're going to see uh, this alliteration is also with the letter F again, and it's going to be right here, okay? Now, we want to point out that the point of a sound device is to always accentuate and emphasize a particular sound. But you don't want to ever write a topic sentence that says, you know, so-and-so incorporates alliteration in order to emphasize the blank sound. No, 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 no. We need to figure out why is that blank sound actually being emphasized, okay? So we want to say, why is it the F that's being emphasized? What is that actually doing for us? Well, let's think about this. If this whole piece is about how shallow and trendy uh, American culture is, Okay, notice what happens here. First of all, we've got the idea of just flocking to Florida. So this is also a pun, right? Because flocks are when people stay in groups. And sure enough, by saying that, you know, Americans are flocking to Florida, it puts them into this idea of their, their you know, birds flock. So they're just like the flamingo. But also it puts them into groups. So it amplifies this idea of trendiness. But also by using the F sound and making that stand out, notice that the F sound is also a soft sound. So although this stands out, it does not stand out as much as perhaps, let's say, a, uh, a hard sound would. And that's really important because we can notice that people are trendy. And as people get trendy, they try to stand out. But in standing out, they actually fit in with everything else. And therefore, they're not actually standing out as much as they think they are. And sure enough, that's exactly what this 
F sound is doing. It stands out, sure, but it's also just the same as all the other sounds. And that's the comment that she's making about the culture. And that's also what's going on down here. The flamingo was pink, a second and commensurate claim to boldness. The plastics industries of the 50s favored flashy colors. Notice you've got that repeated F sound again. So it shows up again, but it's still a soft sound. So these people that are trying to stick out, right? This culture that is trying to stick out is really not sticking out, right? And if they are sticking out, it's not very pronounced, right? And so notice how this alliterative element actually helps emphasize the point of her piece, and that's how you would want to provide the commentary for that. But once again, we don't want to just say, okay, it emphasizes the sound. We want to say the alliteration emphasizes the soft F sound in order to further highlight the message that America is indeed trendy, and that's where we want to provide our commentary for something like that. Okay? And now let's actually check this out in terms of poetry. And we're going to use a poem from Richard Wilber called The Barred Owl. And this is going to help us with assonance because we haven't seen uh, anything about that here yet. One other thing here too is before we look at this, I want you to just think about nursery rhymes that you know. Let's think about how um, assonance and consonants and alliteration work in those. Uh, think about Peter Piper who picked a peck of pickled peppers, right? You have that repeated P sound, right? And you might say, yeah, you're just doing a tongue twister. But that's not necessarily true. Because it, how would we describe the actual sound of when he picks that pepper off the branch, that kind of snapping pop, right? It's the P sound. And so sure enough, you now can have a new appreciation for that little tongue twister slash nursery rhyme there because um, the P sound is meant to actually mimic and give you an experience with that popping element uh, that Peter Piper also experiences. Or here's another one. She sells seashells down by the seashore. Think about the alliterative process there. You have these alternating sounds of sh and s. Well, let's think about this. Sh, 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 sh. What does that sound like? It sounds like the beach. Where is she or Sally or whoever you're talking about? She's at the beach. And so sure enough, right, we have this alliterative element actually giving us a greater experience with setting at that moment. But now let's read this poem by Richard Wilbur and let's see if we can figure out what is uh, being repeated in terms of sounds and let's see if we can figure out why. So it says, a barred owl, the warping night air having brought the boom. Boom right there, just so you know, is um, onomatopoeia. Of an owl's voice into her darkened room. We tell the wakened child that all she heard was an odd question from a forest bird, asking of us, if rightly listened to, who cooks for you? And then, who cooks for you? Words, which can make our terrors bravely clear, can also thus domesticate a fear. And send a small child back to sleep at night, not listening for the sound of stealthy flight or dreaming of something of some small thing in a claw borne up to some dark branch and eaten raw. Now, if we look at this first part of what's going on here, uh, notice the uh, assonance that shows up in here. We have this ooh here, and then we have ooh, and then we have uh, if who cooks for you who cooks for you and notice we've got that repeated ooh sound consistently why would we want that well of course because what was it that the child heard it's the owl's voice it's the boom of the owl's voice that's that's hooing outside the window and that's actually the experience that we get poetry is so awesome because poetry is meant to be a sensory experience overload and because of that we want to make sure that we can glean everything we can from it so that right there is how you look at sound devices in verse and in nonfiction and um and in fiction and i'm just going to ask right now that you click like and subscribe uh because uh the garden of english actually can work to continue, well, I should say, actually tries to provide you with as much English content as we can to help you work through uh, AP Lit and AP Lang and actually any English classes that you're, look that you're in. Um, and these are hopefully skills uh, or at least content that you can bring with you to college as you have to consider these things as well. Uh, we have a bunch of affiliate links down below that you can help the Garden of English in that way. Um, you can check out those links uh, for uh, mock exams or um, for teachers, for lesson planning, um, 
and then also textbooks and things like that. Uh, so please consider supporting us there. Also, we have links to our main website, but we also have merch like for t-shirts like this, right? I hope that you do not suck at English. Uh, we actually have a much cuter skull version of this as well on our website too. Uh, but anyway, nonetheless, uh, please consider supporting the Guard of English in that way. But if you don't want to, you don't have to because these videos are free as well. Um, and we just you know, hope that you enjoy them. So you all have a great day.